Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. There really is an expert this time. Yeah. My name is Eric, not so much the expert here, but with us today, kaiju is the... Kaiju is the term. All right. So kaiju expert, not kaiju. Kaiju is not with us today. No. <laughs> but, um, but really, isn't there a little kaiju within all of us? Michael yeah, that's Kester. something people can say. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. It's good to be here. So this was your idea once again. Yeah. And I love to say that because then if I fuck up, I can it's my fault. you. Immediately my fault. But uh, you know what? You were the one who pushed us back when we were doing the Black Dynamite thing. Oh, let's just get right into it. And I was not ready. And you said, fuck it. We're doing it anyways. <laughs> so today, fuck it. We are doing it anyways. But we have another edition of films double feature will probably never actually be ready to cover Uh uh-huh what are those films we're doing fistful of dollars by sergio leone and gojira by ishiro honda holy crap you're even more prepared than i was ready for so i'm not prepared because there's just so much stuff to talk about in fistful of dollars and you're not prepared because you literally want to watch every kaiju movie right exactly (laughs) and i believe there's still three or four that you've yet how many there's there's hundreds of thousands oh there's so goddamn many and it's really just three or four that yeah i'm down to i'm down to the the bare minimum of what's left and i think the roland emmerich bullshit with matthew broderick is still is that one teetering on my list of should i rewatch that bullshit so we are going to spoil the movies today um, we're going to talk a little bit about the whole Dollars trilogy, but I don't think we're going to spoil much. We're going to keep it to Fistful. And uh, if you like monsters, then I don't I don't know what to tell you. I mean, we have to cover some of the other stuff, right? But yeah. I don't think we would cover much more than what's on a DVD jacket of some of these kaiju movies. Yeah, no, I agree. So if you're super afraid of spoilers, you can skip right now. Skip over Fistful of Dollars. Check that out. Come back to it. And uh, just listen to Gojira, or you could skip Gojira and go to the end of the show, where we have something I don't know what we're doing next week. I do. A Fistful of Dollars is uh, made by one Sergio Leone and uh, a bunch of other people, Sure, actually. There are other people involved in the film. And it is part of the Dollars Trilogy. This is also known as the Man With No okay, Name Trilogy. Okay, I was just going to correct you, but I guess the, it's called the Dollars Trilogy? Well, listen, so since this show is oblivious to actors... Clearly, people who call it the Man With No Name trilogy really like the Man With No Name. And while I, of course, being a fan of the film, also enjoy Clint Eastwood's performance as the Man With No Uh Name or the Man With Three Names, I'm going to call it the Dollars trilogy because fuck that. I just like it better. Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't even I thought this was Dirty Harry going in. I thought that these movies were Dirty Harry. It wasn't until I did a little bit of homework on my own, independently of watching Kaiju. Right, independent study, you mean? That I found out that Dirty Harry is actually not a cowboy at all. No, no, not at all. I'm so surprised when you said that. I thought you were just hitting a really dead joke, but you, you thought this was Dirty Harry you were dealing with. Yeah. No, not Dirty Harry, my friend. We are talking cowboys today on the show. This is, all right, so for people who don't get the trilogy thing, this is a trilogy like the Mexico films are a trilogy. Uh, Mexico films inspired a little bit by the Sergio Leone stuff. I mean, you know, come on, Once Upon a Time. It's in, in the West and there's Mexicans. Yeah, right, right. Um, also, Rodriguez loved bringing his actors back and stuff like that. So a little bit of homages here and there. But it's not the kind of thing. A lot of people have seen The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Yeah. And they were unaware that there were other films. Well, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is one of the highest rated films of all time. Sure. So more importantly than all of that for me is that this is a spaghetti western. It's not the first Spaghetti Western. I mean, Fistful wasn't until 1964, but it is one of the most emblematic. It is uh, a genre piece, if there ever was a genre piece. I don't think that Spaghetti Westerns, we're playing alternate history when I say something like this, Uh but I don't think Spaghetti Westerns would exist if it weren't for the Dollars Trilogy. While they did exist, you know, throughout the 60s, -hmm. this is one of, it's the most popular one. And it's what popularized the genre. You see a huge spike in Spaghetti Westerns after Fistful of Dollars comes out. All right. Now, I don't want to cut you off and and ruin your flow here. No, not at all. Somebody like me, again, somebody going into this realizing this is, in fact, not Dirty Harry at all, might inquire as to why are they called Spaghetti Westerns? That's an excellent question. And one that I didn't even think about the first 150 times I said the term Spaghetti Western. 
Uh, these are westerns made by Italians. Spaghetti westerns, right? Does everyone understand? <laughs> I'm looking around our empty studio asking if our producer is still confused, but that's fine. Spaghetti westerns, like Italians eat spaghetti. <clears throat> She'll work she, on it. She's nodding now. This trilogy in particular was done as a reaction to a lot of the westerns that were coming out uh, at the time, being big budget. You know, westerns had gotten out of control. So we were going to, uh, to kind of bring things in, make things a little more, talk about some more specific stuff and things that I'll, you know, I'll get to as mm-hmm. we talk about the movie a little bit. We should uh, go over what you will find in a spaghetti western, just as we did with, say, black exploitation, sure. so that people can kind of pick these movies out. Um, but one of the things you're going to notice right away, beyond setting, which is really thick, is dubbing. Yeah. Um, we talked about dubbing. Every time Italian movies come up, uh-huh. and this is how we snuck up on Fistful of Dollars, we started covering Italian slasher films. But go back to the Phenomena Deliria show, or what is that, Stage Fright and Creepers, I yeah, think, are the titles. right. And uh, we talked a lot about dubbing there. But we get dubbing here, too. <laughs> what I love about dubbing, and not just Fistful, but the other movies as well, is that there's no attempt at ambience here. All of the dialogue sounds like it's coming from the same room. Right. <laughs> I mean, perform this experiment if you never know what the fuck we're talking about with dubbing. Uh, watch a movie. Just pick a movie off your shelf, preferably one you know isn't dubbed. Uh, you know, something that came out in the last three years that you saw a big American giant sure. smash explosions. And just watch about five minutes of it, but don't watch it. Close your eyes and just listen to what's happening. Listen to the uh, the reflection of the character. Sure, see voices. if you can guess the size of the room. Absolutely, and, and maybe there you go. maybe what the walls are made of. Yeah, and you know what, you might be dealing with something outside, and you could guess that too. And try to just listen to the voices, not the sound effects. Although that'll help as well. Then watch Fistful of Dollars, and if you close your eyes, and you can do this through the whole fucking movie. They're all in the same room, uh-huh. and it's a tiny little they're sound in, studio. They're, they're in. They use this studio. Yeah, the room to record in. Fistful of Dollars. Actually, that's a little known fact about uh, the current double feature studio is that we're in the same studio as Sergio Leone used way back in the '60s. For some reason, they recorded their shit in Uptown Chicago. Don't ask yeah. me why. Producer they did that. now shaking her head. So whether they are outside, whether they're on the streets in a fucking saloon, hiding in a coffin, always the exact same sound to their voice. Uh, not a lot of people notice that with these movies because they're old, and I think a lot of people just say, oh, they're old, they sound weird, not a big deal. There's a huge item on the list of things to talk about specifically for this movie. There is this glaring item of Yojimbo. I just want to let everybody know right now because you're going to be one of two people, uh-huh. right? You either know about the Yojimbo thing. Which is me, so, so for some reason. I know nothing about spaghetti westerns. I you know, know about the Yojimbo, Yojimbo thing. Yeah, uh, so I guess a lot of people know about this. Uh, so you're going to be screaming Yojimbo the whole time. Aren't they going to get to the Yojimbo thing? It's so glaring. How do you not cover it? And other people will now say, Yojimbo, wait, hold on. What's this Yojimbo thing? Just know that we're going to get there. We'll come back around to it in a second, but we have more pressing issues at hand. It's going to make a really good segue. So I haven't actually uh, told you what the movies are in this okay. trilogy, but can right. you name the three, not being uh, a big spaghetti Western guy? Fistful of Dollars, because yeah. that's the one we just watched. Good. For a few dollars more, yeah, because yeah. that's for more money. <laughs> sure. And The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, because you said it earlier. Excellent. Way to go. Uh, Sergio Leone was known for doing spaghetti westerns. Once he kind of found that niche, he just nailed it. And he would later do movies with titles that almost mocked the a Fistful of Dynamite. Or, um, you know, he did Once Upon a Time in the West and would later do Once Upon a Time in America. Did a lot of different things that were specifically spaghetti western or kind of about spaghetti westerns. Later, you know, American filmmakers asked him to do some stuff. So I think that's where a lot of the tongue-in-cheek titles came from. Uh, I'm doing Italian westerns, but, you know, in America. Would it still be a spaghetti western then if he were to do, if Sergio Leone were to do a western in the American Southwest? Yeah, you know, that's a strange thing. Um, A lot of these movies take place in border towns. Uh, So it's not completely crazy to film the movie in America. I think the thing it comes, I know it's a weird audio thing, but for me, it's dubbing. Uh If you film one in Italy and it's not dubbed, I'm just not sure that's a spaghetti Western. But you have to fulfill a certain checklist of spaghetti Western items. And when we look back at exploitation, it gets really hard trying to figure out what's exploitative and what's just bad yeah or what is uh, a particular subgenre of even when we do car exploitation on the show yeah, road man. exploitation 
We don't know if it borders into horror. Sometimes sure. there's fucking cannibals. How much so sex it gets hard turns to... it into a sexploitation right, film? Right. So it's hard to narrow that stuff down. But the Sergio stuff is easy to look at and say, there you have it. That is Spaghetti Western. And a part of that isn't just Sergio Leone, but also Ennio Morricone, who did the score, very, very popular score. Yeah, sure. Um, Piccolo very, and, and, yeah. and guitar. <laughs> grunts, tribal grunts sure. is what it, throughout all three of the movies have these uh, little vocal pieces that are repetitious and you're not exactly sure what they're saying. Sometimes it's just grunts or throat sounds. Uh, but it's not just that. I mean, it's the flute cues as well. Fucking the piccolo every time mm-hmm. the man with no name appears on the side of a building, which is almost comical at sure. this point. Well, there's a really weird scene. I don't know if I didn't want to bring it up during the film, but there's a really weird scene kind of in the early portion of the film mm-hmm. where he's got his cigar in his mouth and he gives a quippy line and then adjusts the cigar in his mouth in perfect sync yeah, with yeah. the piccolo. It looks like he's whistling the piccolo noise. I remember watching it the first time and, and actually going, wait a second, is that coming from his mouth? Sure, sure. Well, you've picked up on another key detail. Morricone worked hand in hand with Sergio to marry the music to the film, uh, almost to a fault sometimes. Sergio Leone would leave certain scenes lingering on past the point where they, well, should be, uh, just because he loved the music and he wanted to do these, sometimes they look like music videos. Mm-hmm. They fit so well with the music to, to the point where you go, is that a sound effect? Right. Well, you know, sure. that's, you call it a cue because it seems like that's, it's directly correlated with the movement on screen. You know, Morricone would write a lot of this stuff, almost all of it before the movie was done, which is sort of the opposite of how it works most often. I mean, you have someone who watches a movie says what score would fit best here and kind of write something for that part. But Morricone would write these pieces and Leone would kind of direct around them. A lot of it's percussion for me, too. I mean, the whip sounds, yeah. whip sounds and tribal grunts, and there you have the score for this movie. It sounds so simple. He makes it look and sound so simple, and yet the creativity behind it to make it such an iconic piece, when you hear one of these pieces, you're instantly brought back to that setting. It does that for you immediately. And that setting is, of course, the Wild West. Westerns, I might say, unlike any other genre, have an incredibly, incredibly distinctive backdrop. One that you recognize immediately, more so than in space. Yeah. I mean, you know when you are in a Western, and a lot of times you know when you're in a fucking spaghetti Western, just by watching a scene of the movie. Just the location, the time, the way that people are talking to each other. It's one of the reasons that you see Westerns parodied so frequently, because that backdrop is so thick, you can just set your characters in it, And immediately you have a spaghetti Western, even if you don't have the spaghetti or the Western components. And that's not just, you know, Mexican standoffs or fanning the hammer of your pistol, Mm -hmm. both things you see riddled throughout Westerns. But the way that the man with no name, he comes into town, much like the mariachi Mm -hmm. from, say, El Mariachi. And you have little to no background about you. I mean, come on, you have no background about this man. You know nothing about him. And he comes up and the bell ringer runs up to him to tell him about the town immediately. They want you to know everything that's going on in the town set up. I mean, this is pretty exploitative. Mm -hmm. This is pretty textbook exploitation. It's exposition. He's telling you, hey, there's two warring factions. Here's who they are. The, The, you know, this is the conflict gives you everything you need to know. And then you also get a kind of pithy poetic, you know, there's no women in this town. Sure. There are only widows. It says something about the danger of the location, about the conflict, but also about just what day-to-day life in this place is like. This isn't a place where people have fun and dance and Mm -hmm. hook up. This is a place where everyone is fucking sad and tragic, and for some reason they don't leave. Sure, and we'll talk about conflict. The resolution of this conflict is that the town has been liquidated of (laughs) human life. Yeah. There are three people left in the town, and it's not because there's been some insane onslaught of innocent blood. Right. A bomb hasn't gone off. It's just all the guilty parties have been eliminated, except, arguably, except the man with no name, who I know you would say is probably just as guilty as the other parties. However, it's that the warring factions have all been eliminated from the scene, and turns out the only survivors (laughs) are... The weirdo bell guy, sure. the coffin guy, who's possibly my favorite part of the film. Awesome. And the bartender. Yeah, and everyone else is gone. 
uh, women and children have probably been slaughtered at this point or are hiding behind barrels somewhere. But it seems like everyone else in the town is completely wiped out and not in mass. One by one, <laughs> they've been wiped out during crimes, during shootouts. He leaves the town and when he leaves, there's nothing he's leaving behind. So it's not, oh, look, he came in and cleaned up he the didn't streets. He did clean up the streets. No, well, he cleaned out the streets he, is what happened. Everyone is just fucking gone. He liquidated the ghetto is what yeah, he did. Yeah, that's what it is. The ghetto of this Mexican border town, this, um, you know, that's what you see in a lot of the, whether it's explicitly stated or not. You deal with the Mexican army a little bit. Uh, there's an idea that this is probably a border town. Mm-hmm. But you also have either Mexican bandits or the Mexican Revolution is a big one. Part of that, I think, comes from these partnerships. Oftentimes, Italy would have partnerships with uh, Mexican studios to make these. Sometimes they would do other foreign studios, too. I think French or Germans, a uh, big one. And the, the studios would insist that their actors be involved as well for giving financial aid. So that's why you see a lot of Mexican actors show up, don't know English, but it doesn't matter because everything's dubbed. Uh, so whether you're shooting in Italian, you're shooting in English, sometimes you're shooting in Spanish, no one speaks the same language in a spaghetti Western. At any given point, you could have actors speaking three dif- different languages to each other all at once, and no one knows because it's dubbed. But to contrast this to other Westerns, just the you know the stuff we sure. were talking about earlier, your John Wayne kind of right. Westerns. I'm a Clint Eastwood guy, not a John Wayne guy, so I couldn't tell you a lot about that. But I do know from catching the end of several of these, they're usually really heavy-handed. They say something about justice or about the law, maybe not necessarily abiding to the law, but sure. the role that the law plays in a society, doing what is ethically right or honorable. This movie is not concerned with any of that stuff. It completely strays from having a deep moral message. You have a man here, first of all, with no past, no context for anything. So how do you judge a man with no past? By his actions. That's all you have to do. You have nothing else to go on. And so what does this guy do? He is completely in this for himself. Yeah. He has no connection with any of these other human beings. This man is none other than Clint Eastwood. So this is Clint Eastwood's big start. This is uh, the movie that is still today, even after he's directed, you know, 50 or 90 some movies, uh-huh. this is what people know him for. And Dirty Harry, apparently. I love that he's given credit for this, not because he's an incredible actor in it. He plays a part and he's as much the spaghetti western as anybody else at any given time. Sure. Uh, I might even say he carries the film. At least this early in the Dollars trilogy, Clint Eastwood carrying the film, that's not, no one's going to disagree with that, right? Yeah, absolutely not. But also, and the reason I love it, is that he contributed so much to his character. And to see that when we get to Yojimbo, maybe you'll see that a little bit more clearly. A lot of the mystery that the man with no name is known for having no fucking name. I mean, that is his name. He's the man with no name. He doesn't have a past. He doesn't have a background. We don't know anything about him. And a lot of that mystery was something that Clint Eastwood insisted on. He wanted lines uh, written out of the movie that explained away too much. So by the time you get to the end product, I believe there's one line left in the whole movie. You know, when he saves the people. Sure. uh, When he saves the woman. Uh And they ask, well, why did you do that? This is the only time you get any insight into his character. And it's awesome because normally you would think, all right, we have no past. We're judging him by his actions. Oh, he did something good for once. He cares about another human being. However, the one line of dialogue lets you know, well, this kind of happened in my past somewhere. The similar situation really sucked. I don't want to see it happen again. So even that is selfish. Even the one person's life who he saves, still an act of selfishness. Earlier when you were talking about this, you said you knew that I would say this guy doesn't have a moral code or whatever. Right. How do you feel about that? I, you know, I have a hard time judging. He's clearly the protagonist of the film. Right. And when I'm watching a movie like this, it, I mean... You get behind the protagonist. Well, spaghetti westerns for me fall into exploitation the way I watch them. I don't, and they should. I don't and watch them. I don't watch them to evaluate morality. I watch right. them. I watch them with both fists clenched, ready to grunt... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And say fucking A whenever any... I don't even right. care who gets shot. Sure. Somebody gets shot and that's what I want to see. You want to see someone whip out their six shooter and take down a swarm of bad guys. I don't care what else they've done. Right. They can walk into the frame, shoot everybody, walk right. out, never be seen again. Great. Good job. Love that scene. I'll talk about it on the fucking show. Right. But I mean, you can't argue that this is not... Yeah, he's certainly not the kind of vigilante we saw when we did The Punisher. Right. This isn't a guy who has any sense of morality... He's not a superhero. He sits in a fucking box 
and watches Rojas kill all of the Baxters. Not even just kill the the sheriff and everybody, but kill them when they're unarmed. Mm-hmm. And, with their hands up, surrendering. And the man with no name, or who is Joe in this movie. He's given a little bit of a nickname. In, sure. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's Blondie. Um, he's given some kind of nickname so that people can say, hey, you, over there. He's sitting in this box, in this coffin, and you might be thinking, first time I saw this, I'm thinking he's waiting to spring into action. And the sheriff is gunned down, and the other man gunned down to his death. And I'm thinking, well, now he's got to spring up and kill these guys, right? He's got to avenge them. And then the woman comes out. Poor fucking woman says, oh, you shot those guys. How could you do that? They were unarmed. And so they shoot her. Cold blood. And only after all that's done, only after that's done, does the man with no name turn to his driver and say, all right, well, I guess the show's Nothing over here. We, here. Might, we might as well go on. You know, he wanted to stick around long enough to make sure that every because he's playing both sides. He's watching the body count. Yeah. He's trying to he's trying to make sure he knows what he's still up against. Yeah. He has to know the score. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong genre for that. What makes this a pretty unique character is although he's somebody who's clearly supposed to be a badass, he falls into the camp of not only quiet badass or non vigilante, you know, gunslinger badass but the kind of badass who isn't invincible. You see, and they need this before the showdown, but you see a moment where he essentially gets his ass kicked. He's crawling around for the whole last act of the movie. He's on the floor, he's bloody, he's bruised, he's under fucking floorboards. It's kind of like, you know, watching, I mean, I remember these these moments, you know, first time I saw a big grand trilogy, something like Star Wars, right? Mm-hmm. Which will come up in a minute, probably why it's on my mind. But to see Han Solo frozen in carbonite, uh, to see Luke get his hand chopped off, these were the moments where our heroes, otherwise fucking invincible, had this moment where, hold on, I thought that this guy was going to crush all evil, and then, uh, you know, he's, he's riddled with holes. He's down on his luck. It's that third act thing to let you know this could still go either way. Right. He's not necessarily just going to come in and crush everybody. And there is a long time that Clint Eastwood spends in the fucking dirt, only to come back up, put the iconic plate in his chest. And uh, I would say save the day, but that's not what's going on here. So to give me some idea of what people might know about this Yojimbo thing, yeah. I mean, what's your take on this? Well, it's a little bit biased because, as you mentioned, I'm a big kaiju guy, which means that by proxy, I'm a big Toho guy. And right. Yojimbo is kind of the last... The last thing Toho did before they invented kaiju. I guess I should give background before we start talking about it. Right. No one knows what... Some I people said might so many know. Japanese so, words right now that people are just... They, yeah, they, they, chapters, chapters. They don't know what language this podcast is in. So Yojimbo we is... Uh, we should. Yojimbo is a... I think we've stressed out our producer enough for one fucking episode, <laughs> dubbing the show into other languages. Uh, so Yojimbo is a... Let's call it a samurai movie. Yeah. Uh, which is probably a broad oversimplification. They're called Ronin films. But no, thank you. It's a movie by Akira Kurosawa. And um, you've seen his movies, even if you haven't seen his movies. Never has one poor man had so many of his films ripped off. I mean, we're going to get to the spaghetti western stuff, okay? But it, even just talking about Star Wars a minute ago, I mean, you know, the Kurosawa films, The Hidden Fortress. Uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces, these were used as the blueprints for Star Wars. You know, the droids walking around, I mean, that is Hero with a Thousand Faces. So this guy makes all these movies, extremely iconic, and then people over here, or apparently people over in Italy, I guess, just rip them off. Now, there's a couple different ways to look at this. Give me your perspective on this, because this wasn't something I considered right away. So I I was always under the impression that Fistful of Dollars was a remake of Yojimbo. Right. That Sergio Leone had the intention of purchasing the rights from Akira Kurosawa, and he was going to remake the film as Mm -hmm. a Western, call it a Fistful of Dollars, and that was it. It was supposed to be a remake. It was the beginning of what we now know as a long trend of remaking from one country to the next to make it more approachable to a specific audience. And then I had heard that... After production of the film, they were unable to acquire the rights, and so Sergio Leone was sued, which delayed the release of the film, and then finally it was released as its own thing and not as a remake. As a mutual friend of ours says, lose the kimono, gain a poncho. But even the difference between the traditional samurai uh, garb, let's call it, I don't want to call it a dress, because then I'll get cut in half with a fucking sword, and and this rug that Clint Eastwood is wearing. 
I mean, the way that your arms kind of fall in it, uh, the opening, this is almost in, in, let's say at least some places, a shot for shot remake of Yojimbo. Um, I actually saw Yojimbo, uh, the other night again. And, uh, just so I would have more of a point of reference because, all right, so here's basically how this happened. When I saw Yojimbo, having seen Fistful of Dollars, I thought to myself, all right, so maybe there's some things that he stole. Uh, you know, they were both based on, Yojimbo anyways was based on Red Harvest. It's based on a book. Maybe they're based on the same material. There's some stuff going on about a play or an opera that they, they both kind of take stuff from. And I'm thinking, all right, so he stole some stuff. Sergio Leone stole some big stuff, big pieces from this movie and tried to pull the wool over everybody else's eyes. But then watching Fistful again today for the show, I'm thinking there is no way there's an accident or he thought he was fooling. It's really shot for shot in places that don't make sense. The the scene, for instance, he's crawling around under the deck or the mm-hmm. floor or whatever, the scene I talked about. There's no reason to put that in your... I mean, if you have... Let's say the worst thing we can about someone who's plagiarizing. They have no creativity. Mm-hmm. Something that's the worst thing to say, but also probably what they expect. You have no creativity. You're going to steal a movie from another person. Sure. You're going to say, I want to create Yojimbo with cowboys, and that's where you start. If you have no creativity, you at least have the smarts not to deliberately. T- it would take more effort to have him crawling along under the stairs or whatever than to hide behind a barn or in another barrel or something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That is something that clearly Leone must have set out to remake the film. But then he was sued by Kurosawa. Right. And this is what makes me think that your story is probably the more likely. You know, once he was sued, and by the way, um, Kurosawa won that lawsuit. The producers oh, yeah. won that lawsuit. And I think it was 15 or maybe even 20% of the proceeds of Fistful of Dollars had to go back to Kurosawa and co. But when he was arguing in court, he was trying to argue points like Red Harvest. He was arguing that he didn't just set out to make Kurosawa's film. And before where I took what he was saying, you know, at face value, because that's just always how I just accept everything everyone tells me because I'm fucking gullible. Uh-huh. I now think that that was probably legal nonsense. That was, wait, 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 I'm getting sued now. I need to try and put some distance between, you know, myself sure. and this other film and make it look like I didn't just do a remake. Certainly a lot of interesting background between those two, especially when you think about stuff like, uh, uh, Kill Bill draws a lot. Yeah. From, well, Kill Bill draws a lot from both Fistful of Dollars and from Yojimbo, uh, from the Spaghetti Western stuff and from a lot of the Kurosawa stuff. I just, you know, mentioned Star Wars. I mean, I don't think anyone's taking Star Wars to task, but it doesn't do it so blatantly. I don't know. I guess if people are really interested in that, the best thing to do is just fucking see Yojimbo. Sure. Right? I mean, just we'll look at the both of them, and then you can try and read between the lines yourself and see what Sergio Leone was doing there. All right, so to move seamlessly from Italy to Japan, as we've already done with our fantastic Yojimbo transition here. Thank you, Kurosawa. So Toho, we're going to start with Toho here. What the fuck is a Toho? We're going to get into Kaiju real quick. And and before we even talk about Gojira, so we're doing Gojira, 1954. The I think the new billing for the fucking thing is the original Japanese masterpiece. We're not doing Godzilla king of the monsters that's the american version we'll get to that too but what i want to do real quick here just fast forward your zunes or whatever the hell we're going to do a quick crash course in kaiju this is mostly for eric i desperately need so a lot of times on the show i will ask you questions facetiously i know the answer but we need to move in a certain direction and people have come to expect good transitions from us because i guess that's what you do when you broadcast uh but this time i really don't know what a kaiju is Every time right before I say kaiju, I start to pronounce it and then look at you for some reaffirming that I'm doing this. I knew no, I haven't seen any of this. Okay. Completely pleading ignorance here. All right. So we're going to start. Let's start with Toho. Toho is this Japanese production company. It was a production behemoth. Sure. In the 50s and 60s and 70s. It kind of trickled off in the 80s and eventually it's still around now. They're not doing the kaiju thing, but they, people will argue with me. Fuck you. Toho invented kaiju. Okay. Kaiju is Japanese for monster. That's what it means. Oh, great. Kaiju means monster in Japanese. There's different versions. There's Kaiju Ega, which is, I believe, giant monster, and Dai Kaiju, which is supernatural. I don't know. I don't remember the exact determinations between all the different type of kaiju, which is why I stick to kaiju. Monster movies. So uh, if people are going to argue this, I mean, the point that you need to know as Westerners 
I promised you I would not call the movie this, but it is on the subject of one Mr. Godzilla. Yes. If you're talking about Japanese monster movies in the West, Godzilla popularized Japanese monster movies. I mean, there was not... Before Godzilla, monster movies may have existed. Maybe it was not the invention. But in much the way we talked about Sergio Leone popularizing spaghetti westerns, that's a key point when you look at this uh, historically through cinema. Right. So historically speaking, Toho invents kaiju. Toho invents not only Godzilla. Mm -hmm. Films called Gojira originally... All the monsters get super sweet American names, and that's fine. Love them. Toho creates Godzilla. Toho also responsible. Are you ready? I'm going to lose you after the first two names. Uh Uh-oh. Toho creates Godzilla, Mothra. Mothra, I know. Ghidorah. Uh Uh-oh. Rodan. And they repopularize King Kong. Well, uh, can we, which one's the giant turtle? Ah, Toho's (laughs) not Gamera. Okay, so that's a separate thing. Gamera is the only well-known separate kaiju. (laughs) Okay, all right. So is that the kind of thing we should probably save for later? I've got a whole different idea for how we're going to do Gamera. Oh, great. And I'm about to explain it. (laughs) Perfect. So Toho starts these kaiju movies Mm -hmm. in the 50s, and fucking ridiculous amounts come out. Multiple per year, okay? They have them all fighting each other. They have them fighting King Kong. Sometimes Frankenstein's monster gets really big and fights everybody. Oh, that's great because they own all the property, so they can do that. Oh, great. So there's just fighting nonstop. It's Freddy versus Jason every year. This is what we're seeing. But Gamera is this other thing where another competing company decides they're going to make this space turtle and come and fight everybody. I love Gamera. Absolutely. Sure. Sounds great. So... The early stages of kaiju is called the Shawa series. Are you with me? I'm, I'm Shawa right here. Shawa series of kaiju. This takes place from Godzilla all the way until they reboot Godzilla in the 80s. Okay. This is basically the, it's the majority. It's like something like 50 or 60% of all kaiju films take place in the Shawa series of kaiju. So we're talking about what? Three decades or something? It's ridiculous amounts yeah. of films. And it's all denoted the original. So in Gojira, and we'll get to this, Godzilla's the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Godzilla beat shit up, and they end up killing him. Later on in the series, he ends up being the good guy. He ends up defending people against King Ghidorah, who's this space monster who comes back later. So in the 80s, Toho starts rebooting everything. Mm -hmm. They reboot Mothra, they reboot Godzilla, they bring back Ghidorah, and Godzilla's bad again. This is called the Hisei series of Shawa. They redo the suit, they redo everything about it. The special effects are all redone. Because Godzilla's a suit, by the way. (laughs) Not in the films, but that is how the the films are made. Actually, let's get into that really quick. Okay, sure. The official title for how the special effects are done in in kaiju films. This will be easy. This is the easiest thing to remember. All right. Suitmation. Suitmation. That's what they call it. You put your fucking actor in a big costume and then you have them stomp on top. Oh, so it's more right. I get it. It's suit plus, I don't know, claymation. Sure, animation. animation. Got it. I'm right here with you. So the Hisei series, they redo all the suits. The special effects are 80s up, I guess. I bet those look great, don't they? They look okay. okay. They're more fun. <laughs> but right. Godzilla's evil as fuck okay. in these. But they also, Gamera, who has gone completely bankrupt, decides to reboot Gamera too oh, in the nice. 80s. So if we're going to do maybe, let's say, a Hisei kaiju a little bit later, if we want to pair up another one of the Leone flicks, why don't we do Gamera then? Oh, yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah, because we need to look at some of that other Leone stuff, too. And if that's not perfect enough, I think you'll remember that we were talking about a trilogy when we were doing Fistful of Dollars. Uh So after Roland Emmerich bastardizes Godzilla. So here's some more fun facts. Godzilla fans will not refer to Roland Emmerich's monster as Godzilla. Oh, wow, really? They called it Gino, which oh, stands man. for Godzilla oh, in name only. Oh, yeah. So Toho, again, kind of does this thing where they reboot Godzilla again in the 2000s. I'm sorry, I still have to get over Gino. <laughs> oh, that's so fabulous. All right, I'm sorry, carry on. So Toho reboots Godzilla a third time for what is called the Millennium Series of Kaiju. And that is what we're in right now. We are pleasantly in the Millennium Millennium Series series of Kaiju. Godzilla has been rebooted, special effects all upped again, still using Suitmation. Thank you, Toho. (laughs) But that gives us a third type of Kaiju that we can bring back if we want to, say, do the trilogy of Leone and three different types of Kaiju Three different eras. We could do fucking Mothra if we want. We'll do whatever we want. Also, adoringly, Toho, who did sell the rights to Godzilla to America for the remake that I'm sure you saw, and I'm sorry you saw it. It's not a very good film. No. But Toho put the Geno monster in their films, in the Millennium series. They named it Zilla, and Uh it has a brief cameo. 
But they acknowledge, you know, we played a part in this. And so the Godzilla community started to embrace Zilla. Wow. Not Gino, but they love Zilla. So they took it back as part of the canon. Pretty much. They, rather than saying that was shitty, let's ignore it. It happened in another country, which everyone would have forgiven them Absolutely. for, Absolutely. Right? No one would have given a shit. Right. Instead, they said, isn't this funny? Let's pull that back over here sure. and use it for well, our and own then they, leg- they legitimize the American version by oh, going, well, great. it's not really Godzilla. It's a different monster, but sure. it's terrorizing New York nonetheless. Right. Which makes sense because if Godzilla, if a Godzilla-like monster came here for the first time, it would be Godzilla. Absolutely. Perfect. So the Toho, the Toho production studios are, I, I adore them for just hanging on to these right. characters and making sure that everybody's satisfied and doing a great job. I mean, we're talking Gojira in 1954. We are sure. in 2010, and there's another Godzilla film that came out, I think, this year. There's a new Godzilla film coming out next year, too. They're all over, and it's just fantastic. We're 46 years. <laughs> Still doing them. These kaiju Still fucking doing them. suitmation nightmares that all started with Gojira. So Gojira, 1954. The Japanese make this film, it's low budget, absolutely horrendous special effects, but practical. And practical effects are the best thing to tout about any kaiju film. Practical down to the popsicle stick in this one. So this is the world's first look at Godzilla, the monster. Mm-hmm. In Japan, they release this film, and it gets... I mean, it's its it gets the same type of billing as an exploitation film. It's built in low-end theaters... People just kind of watch it because you see, ooh, a monster, and it gets to destroy buildings. That's all you care about. It's Attack of the 54 Woman, right? Absolutely. Characters are meaningless, one dimension. They're not even there. It's just a monster. There's some nonsense where people rustle around in their seats, and then the monster shows up and terrorizes. Pretty much. That's exactly what happens. Now, in America, they did this great thing in the 50s with kaiju film. And Godzilla's no exception. So you'll notice that I specified we're doing Gojira here, the 1954 right. version. There's an American remake okay. that came out the same year. It's called Godzilla, King of the Monsters. All right, so you're so not talking about this Matthew Broderick thing. No, no. You're I'm talking ta- about same year, so it's a remake. Yeah, well, essentially what they do is they bring in this Canadian actor, Raymond Burr. Uh-huh. They shoot 70% of this film where he's standing, reacting sitting with a bunch of Japanese actors Uh and voiceovering the entire nightmare. So they just put him into the normal film. Essentially essentially. he gets spliced into the film, but without special effects. It's not like he's standing in the background of things. He's not CG'd in again to talk about the new star Wars movies. Right. But instead a day where star Wars represents all that is evil in cinema. Sorry, star Wars. Instead there's a scene where eye patch is talking about using his, oxygen destroyer oh god and it'll just cut back to raymond burr scratching his chin and nodding (laughs) and then he will turn and and look at the female lead and and ask her what she thinks about it and then it cuts to what she said in the japanese which would normally just be a conversation between the two of them exactly he is now this third wheel that's inserted so that's what to make people feel like it's to eliminate subtitles it's to make people so they don't do subtitles no it's all voiceover so people are just saying japanese shit doesn't matter you don't know what it is The Canadian is there to tell you what's going on. Exactly. They've inserted a narrator into the film. And this isn't the only time this happens throughout Kaiju. This is the the greatest exploitation moment that I... You don't understand right now the wave that is washing over me. I'm totally new to... Wow, this is just amazing. So my favorite thing that happens in all of this American remake bullshit is there's this early Kaiju called Varan the Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Varan's another monster, comes up out of the water. They all come up out of the water. He can fly. The American version cuts out all the flying scenes, throws in an American actor who's hot on the trail of discovering how to kill Varan, the right. unbelievable monster. And he finally comes up with this plan where he's going to use a chemical, and it's a chemical that only he knows how to use. Him and one other man, some other Japanese man that he kind of knows generally because they're sure. in the same field. Right, it doesn't matter. All right. He's hopping in his Jeep, ready to go head off Varan at the beach, and wouldn't you know it, his fucking Jeep stalls. Uh huh. So he has to call up his Japanese buddy, who was in <laughs> the original Varan film, to run up under the monster because they don't have any scenes of this oh American actor God. with the the suit, the the monster, right, the special right. because effects. that would cost more money. Exactly. So they just so they switch to the other version of the film. The, because, they cut to wow. the guy who saves the day, and then. Meanwhile, the American actor is on the phone reacting to all of the wonderful news that Varan has been defeated. This is glorious. So we're doing the Japanese version for (laughs) that reason. But you get the same effect. 
The point of kaiju is never the story. People love to laugh at kaiju because of the subtitles. Gojira, the subtitles are fine. Sometimes the subtitles are awful. Dubbing is is crown mm-hmm. among all. I mean, Japanese cinema in general. <laughs> right. The dubbing is a nightmare. It's not dubbing like we talked about in Fistful. It's taking the Japanese version and translating it and then redubbing it. Right, exactly. That sounds painful. But all you care about in kaiju is seeing these monsters. Godzilla's fantastic for this reason. Every time Godzilla rises up out of the ocean, you know shit's going right, down. Right, right. That's what I love about this movie. You watch 90 minutes, and all you do is you watch the water, wait for the suit to pop <laughs> yeah. up, and yeah. then you get to watch him crush those tiny fucking tanks. Oh, and God does he. Crushes tanks, buildings, eats people, blows up boats complete wanton destruction so i mean if you cheated and you didn't watch the movie and uh that's excusable because it has a scary japanese title maybe you thought we were doing some japanese ghost movie 2008 bullshit so i don't know maybe you didn't see it it's all miniatures and we're talking mini miniatures uh, you know and they they don't even try i mean i'm sure they try they gave it a great effort but these miniatures we get so they try and establish perspective by uh, showing us large tanks. Yeah. And well, I mean, that's probably where all the budget went. You uh-huh. have to get all these large vehicles driving around. So we understand here's how people look next to these. And then they show us toys. Tiny It's tanks. the scene that when you see it mocked somewhere else, it's stupid. But I always think of Spice World. Have you seen Spice World? I have not There's seen Spice There's a scene World. in the, the Spice Girls uh, movie where they have to do an action shot of a bus going over a bridge or something, and they just use a toy bus, and it's very obviously a toy bus. We saw something similar to that in Orgasmo. Yeah. Um, that's kind of a parody of this. It's really toys. It's so... Uh, we're not even watching HD. We're watching it out of your, your bargain bin yeah. DVD collection. It is so obviously toys. By the time they get to the um, the fire trucks, I mean, they're throwing... You know, all their weaponry at Godzilla. Because right. that's what you do. You shoot Godzilla with machine guns, even though that's never worked. Right. Uh, this is really the first time that we can say, well, at least they tried that. Every other movie after this where they try it, they should have seen the first movie yeah. and it didn't work. But they throw all the weaponry at it, and, you know, he's tearing apart everything. And then you see these fire trucks. And the fire trucks are the point of the movie where I went, those are are clearly toys. <laughs> the people flying out of them are not people, they're dolls. And the fire is another one where when the city's on fire, the sure. aspect the the proportions sure. of the fire do not match what an actual fire because you can't scale fire. Unfortunately, right? fire and water you can't change no. in a scale. Raindrops as big as people's heads and perhaps bigger sometimes and uh, single flames that engulf entire cities. Yeah. It's what I loved about, if you go all the way back to when this podcast was terrible, and we did uh, Prophecy 3, Terminator 3, yeah. and uh, I've kind of gone back on how I felt about Terminator 3, but I remember describing one scene that I loved to you of the crane scene yeah. early on. It's just mm-hmm. mindless devastation, relentless, no fucking score, just ambient sound, explosion, destruction, explosion, building after building. And just, it's just mindless. Yeah. And relentless, more importantly. It just doesn't fucking stop, even after the point where it probably should. That's what I love about this movie. Absolutely. The carnage starts, and you know you're tearing apart stupid toy trains, and you just do it anyway. And you keep going. That's the best thing, is that it's it's almost like, okay, we have a giant monster in Japan. What else can we do with yeah, it? Yeah, what are we going to do? The, 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 the train is my favorite, because the train pops up maybe every third kaiju movie, and oh, the really? train is always the best. Yeah. Because the monster crushes the train, or they pick it up and, and slam it into itself. Yeah, or try and eat it. Sure, it's all... The train is fun because they stop it in its track quite literally and that's where you really see this monster toying they're playing yeah. around it's it's a little kid i mean it's a man right in a scale city stomping around swinging his arms later on godzilla gets a little bit campier and there's scenes where he's jumping around and dancing oh wow it's really strange in some of them but they're all enjoyable the other thing that i love about godzilla and and kaiju as a whole but specifically godzilla that noise the Godzilla oh, yeah. scream. It sounds like a rusty garage door opening. That well, does the, not The stomps change. are the... Oh, really? Yeah. They keep that through the... Oh, that's beautiful. Well, 
Well, they nailed it the first time. Sure. Why change it? I mean, there's slight variations, but it's so clear that if if it happens, it's almost like they're going, shit, we we got rid of the sound. What did <laughs> yeah, we do? Right. And yeah. they just do it exactly the same. Yeah. They it, lost it in the sound bank it, and need to recreate it. It doesn't sound like a monster. It yeah. sounds like you said, it sounds like metal, grinding metal. Sure. It and, sounds like a monster now because we have that association sure. of Godzilla. But every monster has their own sound. Right. And it sticks to that monster. And some of them don't make any goddamn sense. They don't make sense as to something that could come out of an organic being. Well, whatever. You nailed the first one the first time, and if Mothra sounds funny, then... is it Mothra that sounds funny? Actually, Ghidorah sounds the funniest. What's a Ghidorah? Ghidorah's a three-headed dragon with no arms. Oh, and that sounds funny. Aren't you laughing? I love that you said no arms, as if that's the thing that makes it. Three-headed dragon, not a problem. No arms, what the fuck? You expect me to believe that? Okay, so we're talking about Gojira. We're talking about the first Godzilla film. I guess we owe you some origin. Although the film doesn't think it owes us any origins. The film kind of tells you Japan got nuked and radiation made stuff weird and there's trilobites in the ocean and Godzilla comes out of... That's it. That Godzilla comes out of the water. Well, they tell you Godzilla's from the Jurassic period. Sure. That's supposed to tell you where Godzilla... They go, Godzilla is from the Jurassic. There's some kind of shellfish thing. And then sand, the the sand is, there's sand, and it's radioactive atomic energy, okay, go. Pops out of the water, Do, starts terrorizing the city. Man, you want to talk about bear or no bear? Here we have it, right? Do, it doesn't matter, people, stop. We don't have time to talk about where Godzilla came from. He's terrorizing the city, let's get to work. That's not even the science that bothers me, it's the oxygen destroyer. So, at the end of the movie... Uh, just out of nowhere, we, I thought it was the end of the movie, but uh-huh. it's clearly not because he just disappeared into the sea. He's going to come back. And, uh, and so we need something to thwart him. I thought we were getting some more origins. Uh-huh. Uh, when the, when Patchy drops some fish food, a little, uh, it looks like, um, an ornament off, uh, you know, a cat collar or something. Yeah. One of those jingly little. Sure. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So your disgusting feline, you know where it is at all times. Mm-hmm. So it drops this into the fish tank. And then uh, the fish, they kind of evaporate. <laughs> the idea behind the oxygen destroyer is that it separates all of the oxygen from the hydrogen. This, of course, suffocates the fish sure. because there's fish no oxygen need, in the water. Fish need oxygen to breathe. And so then the fish uh, melt, they yeah. disintegrate Something because that's what ha- happens. If you started choking right now, you would disintegrate. And then they use that to kill Godzilla. I don't even know where to start here. Okay, first of all, uh, let's get beyond the plausibility of this one guy invented something Uh that separates whatever. Uh, When you choke, you don't disintegrate. Right, that's a fact. But I guess if you're separating oxygen from hydrogen, it could create... Well, if you're removing oxygen from the human body, it would probably rip you apart. Okay, disintegrate. Sure, I'll buy that. But what about from the water? Okay, so that, doesn't that just make the water evaporate? Isn't that so essentially what it would do? What that as would... I see it, I'm not going to pretend I'm a theoretical physicist, but I do. I do have a number. You dabble. I dabble in physics, and from what I understand, if you were to remove all the oxygen, and this would depend on how quickly the machine worked. Let's sure. say it's an instantaneous thing. Okay. If you were to instantaneously remove the oxygen from any given point of the ocean, what you would be left with is a bubble of residual hydrogen which is another gas sure water is made of two parts hydrogen one part oxygen you separate the oxygen it no longer becomes water it becomes hydrogen right the rest of the ocean would fill in around the gap where the oxygen was once and you would have a big hydrogen bubble that would float up to the surface and kind of disperse into the atmosphere it kind of dissipate right there'd be no problem unless i guess if you were trapped in the bubble you would not be able to breathe until the bubble reached the surface. So that's all talking about the theoretical aftermath. We're not talking about what kind of atomic reaction such a machine would cause by instantaneously splitting. Because I think the idea there is one that the film uh, maybe didn't understand, but that could be, again, translation. Um, The idea is there, you you split an atom, you create atomic explosions. Maybe if you split a hydrogen... Uh, an oxygen molecule, it's, it would create... There'd a, still be energy released, yeah, but it wouldn't, okay, be, sure. it wouldn't be at an atomic And that level. might disintegrate a fish, but that's Maybe. not what we're told. Right. We are told that... You well, suffocate. I, right. Well, if you're, if you're calling it a, a nuclear bomb that goes off underwater, a molecular bomb that goes off underwater, I'll believe that that disintegrates a fish. 
but uh, it's not because the fish chokes to death. So this all ends in seeing Godzilla's skeleton, which I also have to tell you, I'm really uncomfortable with. Yeah, I don't... I don't like seeing Godzilla's skeleton. I don't it makes think, me feel awkward. I don't think Godzilla's skeleton was in the American version. No. And maybe that's because it's uncomfortable for us whiteies. Oh, you mean the original American version, not the... Fuck, what was the name they called? The Godzilla King of the Monsters? No, the other one. Zilla. Gino. Gino. God, I love that so much. I have to remember that. Gino. Definitely no skeleton in, in the Gino film. Right. So there's another thing. I mean, we just don't have time. This is the longest show. It's very um, strange. I didn't expect to have this much to say about kaiju and spaghetti. This is all just coming out of nowhere, too. This is We usually have some idea of general themes we can sure. talk about, different things we can discuss. Uh, just getting set up with kaiju takes so much time. I mean, there's still the whole idea of nukes, the U.S. being in the Cold War, mutually assured destruction, and meanwhile, Japan is still dealing with... Please don't nuke us. Yeah, please don't bomb us again. Um, there's a reaction I really like, uh, the, the death curse guy in the very beginning, no one's heard of Godzilla. Right. And there is one man who knows the legend of Godzilla because you need one guy. And I love, you know, the, the fishing was bad. So we sacrificed girls <laughs> to Godzilla. I mean, he, so he wouldn't eat us. <laughs> right. There's just the, the reading, the subtitles of that going, we sacrifice girls and why did we do, why did it reminds me of when we talked about in bright falls i think i've killed a deer <laughs> you know completely different thing we're talking about uh but so much of the kaiju stuff that i feel like we we got to come back to this oh yeah we can there's do it. just we have to do it i would love to do you think we can sneak that into year three or are we gonna have to wait a while for that uh, we have space, right? We could do if, at least if another If you're cool with more kaiju, why don't you shoot us an email? More kaiju, more spaghetti western shit. If you dug this, if you want to hear more of us yap about stuff we're really not 100% sure about, I can say more Japanese words that I don't know the real definitions Excellent. of. Excellent. And I can try and pronounce more Italian names. Perfect. That will be... Your Japanese is so much better than my Italian. Well, that is a double feature show at gmail.com, or at least it's more naturally delivered. Let me say that. It doesn't sound them. as awkward coming out of your mouth until now uh doublefeatureshow.com is the website doublefeatureshow at gmail.com you know what do this if we can't fit two more would anyone mind if we did let's say one more in year year three and then do another one in year four sure because i don't know if we're going to be able to fit some people are going to be iffy about that they're going to want the whole trilogy of shows in year three let's say if we can only fit one more in year three and then do one in year four are you okay with that Send us an email or uh, I'll stick it on our Facebook cool. thing there because people love to vote on weird shit Great. over there. So um, find us on that and send us a donation while I'm rattling off all the things. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. That's all future planning, though. We have some right. immediate plans. Yeah, well, we're going to bring it back home at least for a week. <laughs> yeah, one week and then we'll go off in some more strange directions. Um, we're going to do two American films this time. We're going to do uh Stuck and House of the Devil. Oh my god, you weren't kidding. So Stuck is a Stuart Gordon movie uh with Mina Savari yeah. and definitely an interesting movie, but yes. man, I don't know if you can beat House of the Devil yeah, either. Yeah, that's Ty West. That is a that's a fucking heavy oh, first time we'll get to talk about Ty West too, which you know, House of the Devil is one of those those rare movies that makes us break the whole probably shouldn't talk about films that just came out uh -huh. because what the hell do we know thing. We don't like to compete with the film review buzz out of fear that we'll get thrown into that. Right. But House of the Devil, it's been, you know, a year or two mm -hmm. and it just needs to be talked about. So watch more fucking film that. Bye.